Hello everybody and welcome to another Houdini tutorial. Today we will be talking about the Pyrosource Blast Wave and the Pyrosource overall in Houdini. Um, I find this node very fascinating and we're going to go over its functions and all the different types of burst animation, burst components, and attributes it has. So let's get started. We will also be creating the simple kind of pyro simulation of a dust poof. So just so you can get the basic idea of what this node does, and we're also going to go over the side effects documentation for this node. So let's get started. So let's take a look at the pyro burst source geometry node in the side effects documentation. So as you can see, it's a very diverse node that can let you do many different types of explosions and also simulations. You can see through the demo material that it is quite active and it cre can create a very complex smoke sim. So basically it takes the incoming static points and replicates clusters of points around them in some arbitrary blob, blob in quotation, shapes that captured an explosion's initial form when the burst type is set to explosion or muzzle flash. Points are then scattered onto the surface of the blob shape when the burst shape is generated. And then based on if what type of shape it is, so if it's set to shockwave, the points are generated into a three-dimensional sphere and can be limited to specific slices on the sphere, giving you a flat shockwave ring spreading on the ground or three-dimensional dome blast shapes. For blast rings, the points are generated into multiple flat two-dimensional rings. These can be used to create rings spreading above a fireball. As a dome blast shape expands, this type of behavior can be observed mostly on large-scale explosions. So, some notes to keep in mind with this node. It's important to keep track of the number of incoming points. And when you're working on explosions from a fast moving object, it is possible to animate the position of the incoming points. However, other attributes controlling the burst property should never be animated over time. So be careful when you're doing that. Um, we're probably gonna break this rule just a little bit today, but um, we'll see what happens. There's no straight way to use something in Houdini. It's only up to your personal preference, but you should follow the documentation when you need to. Um, so yeah, it is made. It has several burst components. So these include density, temperature, divergence, burn, color, alpha, and these are represented by colors. The output of this node would be a mix of these components, and each are responsible for sourcing the own specified attributes that you need for a sparse pyro simulation or a legacy pyro. These attributes should be rasterized into volumes, and they can be done so using the volume rasterize attribute SOP, which we will be using today. So, the other things you should know about that is that the initial size, the direction, the rings that are generated all have different attribute names. So these are the different ones that you can look into or activate using these nodes. So points with attributes corresponding to the names that we just went over of the burst components will act as multipliers for those source values. So these provide value control over time for each pyro burst source. And then we have the different types of explosions you can generate with this node. So as you can see, it's very complex and it's got some very interesting attributes that can help you go over and create an individual explosion. So let's dive back into Houdini. So looking at our little animation again, you can see that our little smoke disappears over time. And you can see that if I had to go back to this, I'd probably edit the dissipation just a little bit more. So let's take a look at our pyro source blast wave. So taking a look at our pyro burst source, we can see that I have it on a blast wave setting. Basically what this means is that I've put it onto shock wave. So the initial offset is 18. We've got a spread angle of 120. We play with the amplitude of just a little bit as well as the roughness and offset. Now you can see here that I have some animation and you can see that this, um, shape only lasts for a period of frames. So it disappears around frame 31. And this is because if we go to our burst animation, we have a start frame of eight. So that means it will start at frame eight and last for 23 frames. So eight plus 23 is 31. We've then played with the interior expansion, exterior expansion, and as well as the directional translation as well. So I'm just going to delete the channels for that, and we can also 
as you can see, play with that if we wanted to. First components, you can see that I'm creating a source, which is create density, as well as source value scale. And we have the option of enabling noise and also the burst overrides for the start frame, and the seed office, and the expansion scale. You can then att uh, output attributes as well. So the particle scale and the velocity. So if we turn on our velocity, you can kind of see it as it expands outwards. It kind of slows down as it gets bigger, but it speeds up as it's expanding. So we had velocity noise. We can kind of see things, our velocity trails change just a little bit. We also have the option of adding randomization attributes. So going down here, you can see that I've used sparse pyro. So the reason I, the way I set this up was adding a billy smoke solver. So you go to pyro configurability smoke and you'll notice that this torus will appear, but you'll just let Houdini think itself out. It will create a default setup for you, but we're only really interested in the pyro source, the attribute adjust vector velocity, the volume rasterized attributes, and the ability smoke. So what ba basically you'll delete this torus and connect it to your pyro burst swap, and that will be your new emitter. So deleting that, let's scroll down to our original setup. Let's go to our pyro burst source. So we've got a particle separation of 0.05, particle scale of 2, and we're rasterizing two attributes, density and temperature. The next thing we're doing is going to our attribute adjust vector velocity, it's choosing our attribute V, enable and preprocess, overwrite initial value, and we've got these different settings. We haven't really enabled anything, but we're animating noise. Technically, uh, you might not need this if you use the Pyro Blast Wave because it's already adding velocity settings in for you, but in this case, I wanted more velocity noise. Volume rasterize attributes, once again, density, temperature, V, voxel scale, size, three. So if we go to frame 16, we should see something on the screen. We see these rasterized attributes. If we go over to our adjust vector velocity, we can see once again it's adding some more uniform kind of noise into our explosion. And it's pushing everything upwards. The next thing we have is a billowy smoke solver. So if we go down here and we take a look at everything, you'll notice that there's a big difference from the uh, sparse pyro solver from Houdini 18.5 to 19, and that's the number of parameters that you see on it. So once again, you have the options of playing with your start frame. You've got voxel size, time scale, max and min sub steps are now moved into this general setup tab. Going to the bounds, we have the option of playing with the bounds a little bit more. We can also limit the maximum size that we want this to go to. We also can play with the boundary collisions and the resizing and the padding as well. Going to the sources, we can limit the source range. We can also play with the density and the activation of the temperature and the acceleration strength and the deceleration strength of the temperature. And then we can also add our velocity back in and play with that scale as well. The next thing we can go is to our fields, but we can also have the option of adding collisions into here. If you wanted to add a collision, you would add it into the second input of the solver. The next time you go to the, you can see here that I'm animating the dissipation. So over a period of time, if we switch this over to manual, you will see this value start to change. So around frame 50, dissipation is zero, and it's also at one here. And that was just to taper off any smoke that was still dissipating after frame 50. Scrolling down, and you can see that we have the options to play with color, temperature, and speed as well. Looking at the shape, we have the option of playing with the buoyancy, wind, shape guides. So if we look at the shape guide, we can have the option of looking at the disturbance, turbulence, shredding, hourglass filtering as well. Hourglass filtering is very new. So now one reason we can't take a look at hourglass filtering in the simulation is because that visualizer isn't visualizing any parameters that are currently in the simulation. So we are looking at the disturbance, 
Just so you can get a better idea with the visualizer for Houdini 19's pyrospersal or kind of looks like. So as you can see, it's just kind of a plane that kind of looks like that on the default setting. You can also play with the 3D aspects as well. And that's kind of just what it looks like. So we'll turn that off for now because we don't really need it. So after taking a look at that, let's look at the disturbance itself. So you can see that it can visualize the disturbance because this parameter is turned on. So we have, we've played with the disturbance, the block size, the roughness, and that's pretty much it. Turbulence we've also played with as well, and the shredding as well. Everything else we've turned off. For the look, we've got smoke, density scale of five, smoke color is a pure white, and everything else for this except for sign material is turned off. So one cool thing about the sparse pyro silver in Houdini 19 is for a sign material, it will automatically assign a material here. So we can jump to it in the shader here. Pretty cool. So let's head back up to .NET. So over here in our export setting, you can see we can choose which parameters we'd like to export. You can also choose what if you want to convert it to a VDB, resample the volumes, the voxel scale size, and the flame density as well. So you can see that there's a huge amount of improvements that have been added to this setup. The other thing that's been added when you drop down a default setup is the pyro look or the pyro bake volume sop. So basically this allows you to assign materials as well as play with the color of the smoke, the density range, as well as scatter some other intensity scales and hot core scales into your simulation. As well, if you were doing fire, secondary fire, and if you want to play with bindings for the smoke, scatter, fire, secondary fire, and bake emission. But you will have to enable that parameter. The next thing you'll want to do is add down a file cache and cache everything out to disk. And by the end of it, you should have a billowy smoke simulation. And I hope you enjoyed this tutorial. My name is Kate, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.